Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to the webinar on solar powered water systems in humanitarian context, making sense of SPWS expansion. My name is Ranisha Basnit, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar today. And I'm joined by my colleague Asinat Kiprona from Oxfam, who will be assisting me with the Q&A round. As you know, this webinar is a joint collaboration between Solar Hub, IOM UN Migration, Oxfam, USAID, and Energypedia, and is part of an ongoing webinar series. We had our first webinar in November 2020 when we introduced the solar water pumping systems, talked about the different configurations and pumping types. If you have not had a look at that webinar, we will share it with you in the follow-up email that will go out after this webinar, so do have a look. And all the webinar documentation from this webinar would also be sent to you in a follow-up email. We have two other webinars coming up in February and March, and also do stay tuned for those two webinars. And before we start some few house rules, so today we are taking your questions. So do use the question box on your wind on the right side of your window to send you your questions. In case you cannot see the question box, uh, there should be an orange icon. So if you click on that icon, a pop-up bar will appear. And there you have the option called questions where you can type in your questions. So please do send in your questions and we will try to answer all of them. Even if we cannot answer all of them today in this webinar, we will document them in written form and upload it to the webinar documentation page, which you can access after the webinar. So do send in your questions. And also please tell us to whom the question is addressed to. For example, uh, person one, or speaker one, speaker two, or certain topic, uh, so that we know to whom to assign to. So that would be really helpful. So please use the chat box. And in case you are using a tablet or a mobile phone, and you cannot see the chat window, there should be an option on the upper right side, there is a question mark. So if you just click on that question mark, a pop-up window will appear where you can type in your question. So a quick look at today's agenda. Today we have three presentations. We will kick start with the first presentation from Water Mission about retrofitting solar. Then we will go to a second presentation from US Geological Survey about over pumping of aquifers. And finally, we have our third presentation from IOM UN Migration about economic analysis of solar pumping schemes. And then we have a Q&A round where we will take in all the questions that are coming in. And in the meantime, my colleagues, uh, Lisa and Asinat, will also be addressing as much as possible to the questions that are coming in. So without further ado, let's kickstart this webinar. And I would like to welcome our first presenter for today, Jeff Japar from Water Missions. Jeff leads the Global Engineering Department at Water Mission and is a registered professional engineer in the United States. And today, Jeff is going to talk about retrofitting solar into existing water schemes. What are the things one should keep in mind? And Jeff, I'm going to send you a request now to share your screen. So if you could accept my request and share your screen, that would be great. Okay, Renisha, are you able to see my screen? Perfect, I can see it. Please go ahead. Very good. Well, I'm pleased to be with everyone today to uh, go through this presentation. Move this over. So the presentation I give the, uh, today will be on retrofitting existing uh, electromechanical uh, pump installations. When you're going to take those that they're on a current power source, whether that's generator or AC grid power, and move them to solar. So Water Mission, just as a fast uh, background for you, we have been uh, involved in solar-powered water systems uh, for well over 10 years at this point. We've we've installed well over a thousand uh, new systems. These would be systems that weren't existing, obviously first, but a brand new uh, water system equipped with solar as their means of power. But as we've seen solar become more of a proven uh, technology uh, for the sector to use within water systems we've seen increased calls for retrofitting those existing systems that already have a power source to move them over to solar. Uh, the common areas where we've seen this happen are, are in uh, refugee IDP camps, 
Um, we've also seen this uh, in the midst of, of a disaster recovery where the existing power source has been wiped out. And then even within community water systems where the community just desires to, to go to, uh, to solar for, for many different reasons. Just two fast pictures, just of uh, two example areas where we have done this uh, within Water Mission personally is uh, uh, refugee camps in Tanzania where there were several systems that were driven by generator. And then we took those existing pumps uh, over to solar. Another example, this would be specifically on a disaster recovery, um, would be in Puerto Rico where a couple of years ago the Hurricane Maria came through uh, did a, a quite extensive damage to their existing power grids throughout the island. And so as part of that recovery, we put in several solar systems uh, to put those water systems onto a, a different power source instead of the power grid. Some of the common reasons that we have seen for this uh, to retrofit uh, to solar, the most obvious would be a reduction in cost where you're uh, removing your cost from, from either the fuel or the, the reliance on your power grid. Reduce the dependence on your fuel supply and logistics. This can be a, a big factor in refugee and IDP camps where there, there's difficulty in getting the fuel uh, for it could be a number of reasons. And so wanting to uh, not have that reliance, which would be the third thing, the reliance on the generator which would then drive that, that fuel supply. Uh, fourth, again, reliance on uh, grid power reducing, not wanting to do that. There could be a number of reasons, which I'll, I'll go into with, with Puerto Rico a, a bit later. Um, and then lastly, is just uh, building resilience in the face of uh, future disasters. Obviously, this is uh, particularly to disaster response, but as we've seen is in the recovery phase and some disasters of saying, well, we don't want to be in a position again where our power supply is wiped out. Uh, so can't we move it to uh, solar as, as more of a resilience effort? So really the most of my presentation today is going to be on the information that we have seen critical to, to gather. So what information is necessary uh, to design and install a retrofit uh, solar system? And I'm gonna break this down into five basic categories that I've listed here. So information is what we see needs to be gathered on the following. The pump, so if this is an existing pump, which is what we're saying, it's existing water system, you're gonna need the information on that pump. Uh, if it's driven off a generator, it's good to get the information of what the generator is there now. Uh, information on the borehole, most of these I'm gonna be talking about are, are groundwater source, so information on the borehole. Well, it, it could extend, yes, to other uh, water supplies as well. <clears throat> Fourth would be just the overall water system itself. What's some of the critical information that you would need off of that to move forward? And then just some general information that will be critical for the installation if it get, does get to that point. So I'm going to walk through each uh, five of these with a series of questions. So as first I said is on the pump itself. So this is saying that there's a, a pump that's been uh, used in this water system for we don't know how long. And so we're going to go and look at that and gather all the information. The easiest, obviously, the, the biggest two things, just the make and model. What is the make and model of this pump and what information can you gather? Some of the rest of the questions on this sheet uh, or this slide uh, may be available at the site, but you know if you can get that make and model, some of this information you can gather uh, online or from the manufacturer. So that other information would be uh, number two here. You know what are the power requirements of the pump? Is this a single phase, a three phase? What's the voltage? Uh, what's the pump wattage or horsepower that it's rated for? Uh, third would be what is the pump flow rate? Um, and then fourth, how many hours per day? And this is where you're starting to get to the system, but how many hours per day is this pump uh, required to run to start to meet the, the water demand that, that this system or this community has um, off of that? Moving then to the generator, again, this would be if there is a, a generator, if it's driven by a generator currently, um, so what is the make and model off of that generator? Uh, what is the KDA that that generator is, is rated for is going to be critical to, to gather. 
Okay, let me move to the to the water source. Okay, the the borehole. These are some questions. I'm going to get into a bit more explanations. We go through this as well. But first, what is the intended or the expected water production? This would be in volume. The water production uh, that's expected out of that borehole per day, and does this fluctuate? Uh, throughout the seasons. You're going to want to know what that is. And then next, maybe a bit obvious, but what is the tested yield of the borehole? Um, is there, um, has there been, number eight, has there been a, a yield and a drawdown test uh, performed that can show these things and start to back this up? Where this is all, maybe you can guess this at where my questions are going, but what you're starting to do is you're gathering all the information almost as if you were building a brand new system. And that's what we've seen is the best to do in these retrofit um, applications is say, okay, if, if, if there was no existing water system now, um, what would we do as a, as a brand new design? And so it, we're looking at it kind of through that lens, but we're saying, okay, if we were doing this design, would we agree with the equipment that has been installed now? Would we agree with you know, using that pump in connection with this borehole, knowing that these were the yield and drawdown uh, results from those tests that were performed? Do we agree with that? Do we feel like this, this fits? Uh, because if it does not, there may be a problem later if, if we just say, hey, we just wanna update the power source. Well, maybe that's not appropriate if, if maybe this isn't the best fit you know, the pump with the borehole and what's being expected of it anyway. So number nine, what's the dynamic water level of the borehole? Does this change with seasons? Uh, 10, where will the water from the borehole be delivered? Uh, you know, where is the water storage tank? How does the water get there? Um, again, uh, say, saying that you kind of want to look at this through, do you agree with the design of the system uh, the way it's already installed. So if if you were the one putting in, you know, the storage tank, if you were the one, uh, your organization putting in this piping supply to go from the borehole uh, to the tank, do you agree with that? Does this all make sense uh, with you? Um, let me let me go on because this will maybe become a little bit more apparent in, even with the next slide and then a, a couple more points. Um, so this is where I'd say, now that you've gathered all the information, let's look at the system as a, as a whole uh, and to see still, does this fit? Does this make sense to you that this system was a good system? Uh, number 11, what is the required standard uh, for the water supply per person per project? You know, if there is a, a government or a, you know, an agency standard uh, for the amount of water that should be supplied per person, uh, from this water system, what is that? And so, the, you know, you're starting to do those checks as well. Is this going to adequately, um, has it been adequately supplying water to this, to these, uh, to this community or, or this camp or whatever that is? Uh, is there an existing storage tank? I already alluded to this a bit, uh, but what is the ratio of the water demand versus the tank size? Um, what is the current water treatment method at the borehole? You know, is it is it one that's appropriate? What what impacts does that have uh, on the pump or the amount of power that maybe the pump is is needing to produce uh, to go through the water system, uh, the water treatment system? Sorry. Uh, and then the next two become really critical. Has there been satisfaction with the current function of the water system? And this is where it's really getting the key that if if the answer is no, then this may be something you may need to address before you just go to switch the power source over to solar. Or number 15, is there satisfaction with the equipment itself? If no, what is that concern? Now, that may seem like a lot of things and, and, and you may be wondering, you know, why would we say we need to consider, do we agree with the original design of the system before just switching the power source uh, from let's say generator or grid over to solar. And the reason that I would say that, and the reason we've become strong to believe this at Water Mission, it's that when we have looked into uh, people's uh, dissatisfaction with solar, it is usually not because of, of the technology of solar power itself. It is usually because when we've dug into further into the system, and it's not just water mission, there's other agencies, uh, UNICEF and others have looked at this as well. There's that the system that was installed was 
did not have the capacity to meet uh, the water requirements that they were hoping to get out of it. Either that was because the, the borehole, the yield of the borehole was inadequate to meet the full water supply, or maybe the borehole was fine, but the pump that was installed was not adequate to meet that water supply. And so what I'm saying is that if, if it's a system that originally the, the community was having a problem with, didn't, um, didn't uh, it wasn't meeting their daily water needs, just switching over the power um, is not likely to, to really remedy that situation. And so what we don't want to do is then label solar as, well, it doesn't deliver, when no, that wasn't the fault of the solar itself. That was the fault of the original uh, infrastructure, the equipment that was that was put into there. And then lastly, I, I said there's some critical pieces of information uh, so you can move to the installation. Um, and these are these two things. What space is available for the solar array? And then number 17, what type of security for the solar array uh, may be needed? Uh, there's several things that uh, could be done for security of the solar panels, perimeter fencing, uh, elevating the panels kind of above uh, a head height, uh, securing the panels using uh, strategic welds or anti-theft bolts. And the reason I concluded this picture here, even though this is a pretty small array, uh, and pretty much all of these measures are, are shown in, in this uh, photo here. And so those are going to be critical things too. If, if you're going to move to solar, uh, is there space available to do that? And then is there a security concern of putting in these panels that uh, could be attractive to, to, uh, to either theft or vandalism? All right, let me give you a, a very straightforward example uh, from our response uh, after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, just to, to give a, a fast example of how we did this uh, within Water Mission. It, within Puerto Rico, there's existing uh, AC grid before Hurricane Maria went through in, in 2017. Uh, at this particular community, they had a water distribution system. It produced about 75 cubic meters a day. Uh, Hurricane Maria again came through extensive damage to the whole power grid, wiped out the power grid, especially for this community. There, it was not going to be recovered anytime soon. Uh, and then even as we got to know the community, we found out there was disruptions in their power supply. Uh, through their grid connection even before the storm. As a part of the, the hurricane response, there was a donation that was received to, to move this over to, to solar. And so that's how we got into this uh, particular project at this community. As I said, the first bit of information you want to look at is the pump. Uh, and so we uh, went to look at what the existing pump they had been using previously. In this case, it was a Franklin Electric three-phased, 230 volts AC, uh, 20 horsepower. Here was the, the pump curve we were able to get from this manufacturer. That was the first step. Um, second step, we started to look at the borehole and the system information. Okay, this is where a lot of communication uh, with the, the current operator, current owner of that water system, we found that the system was uh, on average doing about 12 and a half cubic meters per hour. Uh, what they said is that you know over six hours or so of runtime a day at that rate, they were able to achieve their 75 cubic meters per day. Uh, they were happy with that. Um, they felt like it was adequate. They had the information, my third point here, they had the information to show that the borehole uh, was appropriate. It had a, had a somewhat of a current yield test to show that that was, uh, that was true to what it could perform. Um, really across the board, this system met what the community wanted with the exception of the power supply. Even before the storm, as I said, they had issues with the power grid um, being available 24 hours a day to where whenever this six hours they wanted to turn it on that they could do so. And then with the hurricane that came through, completely wiped out uh, their power supply. And so they had no way of, of producing water. We saw this as a great candidate uh, to put in solar uh, for several different reasons. One, six hours was pretty easy. As you can imagine in Puerto Rico, it's close to the equator. There is more than six hours of sun pretty much on a daily basis in, in this area. Um, that's a question we may come back to, but this would, was definitely an easy 
easy choice for going to solar because we were able to tell the community you're probably going to be able to get throughout most of the year uh, your water production on solar alone and so now you just completely reduced your reliance on the grid there is adequate space uh, near the existing water system to install a large array and you'll see it was a pretty large array we had to do for this one uh, there was an agreement to install a fence around the solar array they felt like that's what they needed for security um, the community leadership was in support which is a, a very strong point by the way to make sure that the leadership is in support of doing this and then the funding existed uh, to move forward so what we did is we reused that existing pump that franklin electric pump we reused the piping we, we kept the same water treatment we kept the same water storage what we added on was a, a Grundfos uh, 15 kilowatt RSI, which is a VFD inverter uh, that can take uh, solar input and then drive a, an AC pump. Uh, for this particular system, we sized a 72 panel array. These panels were 345 watts. Uh, for this particular arranged uh, nine strings of eight panels, uh, and that was gonna be adequate for that. We also installed appropriate uh, disconnect and changeover switches so that when in the future, when their AC grid was restored, uh, they could switch it back over from uh, solar to uh, their AC grid if they desired to do so. All right, the questions that I would anticipate is, okay, well, how did, how did you check all that? How did you uh, know that? There are two options that we see to check the, the array size and to check is the, the water production of the system gonna be uh, able to, to do this on solar? What we usually start with is the manufacturer uh, software. And in, in our example, Grundfos, although Lorentz has a great uh, system as well uh, to use to size these systems. We usually start there and see what their proprietary software would recommend back as far as what type of inverter, uh, what size solar array. And then we've come up with our own design uh, methodology based on fulfilling uh, the international standards from the IEC as well as based on uh, Grundfos and Lorentz and the methods that they use. I can't go through all those now, I don't have time. Um, however, those calculations and details, uh, they're laid out uh, in the Solar Powered Water System Design and Installation Guide uh, that we have recently uh, published with UNICEF. And that is available online. I realize I'm gonna go to the next slide, but this is something that we can uh, get to you if, if that's of interest to you. And then there's two common questions that I'll kind of do this right now before I, before I end my part of the presentation. Um, it, and these are two common questions that usually come back from when we talk about this example. It's, well, what if the daily water demand cannot be produced uh, in a solar day? Um, again, I, with my example, it was an easy example because there was six hours, there was more than six hours available of sunlight uh, in this area of Puerto Rico. And we knew that we would be able to drive the pump at full capacity for at least six hours for most of the year, if not all the year. However, yes, there are systems where that's not possible. Let's say you have a max, you know, seven, eight hours of sunlight. Um, you're going to need to run that pump, let's say, you know, 12 or, or more hours. This is where you may have to put in those uh, different uh, changeover uh, disconnect switches where you could go you can take it off of solar and then maybe you still need to go back to what was that AC power source, whether that was a generator um, or grid. But again, you, if you do that, you've reduced your reliance. You haven't cut out your reliance on your AC power source, but you've reduced your reliance on it. And then the last question that comes up is just, you know, you're mixing different brands of equipment. What are the pluses and minuses of doing that? And I would say, to go back to the beginning of the presentation, that's where it's important to, to get all the information on the equipment that's already there and to know what that is. And that if, if, if you have that information and you can look at it electrically and be comfortable with the fact that it's okay to mix these um, brands of equipment because they match electrically, then that may be okay to do so. There's other considerations that could come in you know, as far as what's the, can you procure that equipment easily if it breaks down in the future? There's other things that do, yes, enter into that consideration. For this one in Puerto Rico, we felt like um, this was a good uh, solution for us. And so we have done that. 
Renisha, I believe I'm about to end the time. I know we're going to have a time for the end that question. So I'm going to stop there. And unless we have time for a quick question right now, I can turn it back over to you. And then we can save the questions to the end. But thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Jeff. And perfect timing. So let me quickly switch back to first to my screen. And thank you once again for giving us great pointers about what to keep in mind regarding retrofitting. Regarding the questions, we have a lot of them coming up, but we will keep all of them for the Q&A round. So now I would like to move forward with the webinar uh, with a short poll. And I'm going to quickly display a poll question in your screen. So there should be a poll question popping up on your screen. So do uh, tell us where are you logging in today from? Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America. And this is again to understand you, the audience, better so that uh, our other webinars can be more tailored to your time zone, to your interests, and so on. So I'm going to leave it for a few more seconds as the answers are coming in. And now I will close the poll and display the results. So we have a lot of attendee coming from Africa, followed by Europe and Asia and others. So welcome to all of you one more time. And now I have a second poll question for you. So um, it should be coming up on your screen and do tell us in which sector do you work? Um, if you work in the humanitarian development, it could happen that you, your project that you're working is both humanitarian and development, then please choose the third option. So we're going to leave it for another few more seconds as the answers are coming up. So another few more seconds. And now I'm going to close the poll and display the results. So um, a large portion of the audience today are working in the humanitarian sector, uh, followed by humanitarian and development organizations. So thank you to all of you for taking part in the poll. And now moving back to our presentation. So let's uh, proceed with our second presenter for today, Richard Haley from the US Geological Survey. Rick is a groundwater hydrologist with more than 40 years of experience, and today he's going to talk about the overpumping aspect of solar water power system. So Rick, I'm going to send you a request to share your screen. So you should now have a request on your screen um, if you could accept it and continue the presentation. Perfect. Okay. Um, if, uh, if you could also put the presentation in full screen mode, uh, please. Yes, perfect. Great. Well, thank you, Renisha, and uh, uh, thank you all for everyone who's attending. So what I'd like to talk about today is the link between solar-powered groundwater systems and sustainable management of groundwater resources. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Bridget Scanlon, who helped me put this presentation together. Um, we've heard a little bit about solar powered systems already, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Um, these are uh, a very nice way to provide clean, inexpensive, reliable water to millions of people worldwide. Uh, and the innovations that if it, been made in, in these systems in recent years are, are just amazing. And they're being installed um, all over the world. Uh, at the same time, we need to, whenever we're tapping into our groundwater resources, we need to think about sustainable management in order to ensure that uh, future generations will, will have a stable um, water supply. And 
Um, I'm going to show some um, examples and data from Africa, um, but the, the, the relevancy of the presentation is not limited to Africa. Uh, it really applies worldwide. It's generally accepted that groundwater is an underused resource in, in much of Africa, as you can see from, from this, this map here. There is a lot of groundwater there that can be used for beneficial purposes. I'd like to uh, go over each of these bullet items uh, in, in, in regard to groundwater in Africa. We know that aqu aquifers provide drinking water uh, and domestic for domestic and irrigation use to millions of people. As I mentioned, groundwater is underused. Uh, it's been estimated that there are up to 1,600 uh, cubic kilometers of water that could be used uh, annually for additional irrigation. Groundwater use is increasing uh, in part due to the installation of, of solar systems. And as that groundwater uh, use increases, it should draw our attention to um, the potential for aquifer depletion. Um, aquifer depletion is just a reduction of the amount of water stored in an aquifer to the point that the aquifer can no longer provide uh, water at, at the, the desired rate. And um, Aquifer depletion is not specific to solar systems. You can deplete an aquifer with any kind of pumping system. Um, and prudent monitoring and management of groundwater can, can help ensure that future generations will have uh, stable supplies. So solar powered groundwater systems offer the option of affordable long-term remote monitoring of pumping rate and groundwater levels. And these are keys to sustainable management. We need this information in order to sustainably manage our resources. And the solar systems provide a, a very nice and convenient way to collect that data. And, and that is gonna be the emphasis of my, my presentation. So uh, Jeff already expounded on, on many of the benefits of uh, solar-powered uh, groundwater systems. Uh, and these include cost. You know, there is uh, perhaps a large upfront cost in installing a system, uh, but the operating costs are generally pretty low. And there is some additional cost involved in collecting the, the data that I just mentioned, the pumping rate and the groundwater levels. Other benefits include reliability. Uh, these systems are environmentally friendly in terms of uh, we're not uh, you know, dumping a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, they're flexible, can go off grid, and uh, they can be operate, operated remotely and they offer, again, the option for remote data collection. Oops. Uh, United States, or United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number six is to ensure availability and sustainability of water and sanitation for all. And these solar powered systems directly address this goal. They also address the goals of ending hunger and uh, achieving um, uh, sustainable food supplies, secure food supplies. Groundwater sustainability, by definition, is the development and use of groundwater resources to meet current and future beneficial uses without causing unacceptable humanitarian, economic, and environmental consequences. Aquifer depletion occurs worldwide, as indicated by the areas in red here. We see it in both developed and uh, developing countries. And it usually occurs from long-term overpumping of aquifers. This is not something that occurs overnight. It's usually uh, 
a process that occurs over decades of, of use. And you can see in Africa right now, it's, it's not a tremendous problem. Um, there's not too much overuse occurring. When we consider um, aquifer depletion and overuse, it's good to do that in terms of the water budget of the aquifer. And the water budget for an aquifer just states that uh, water coming into the aquifer input minus water flowing out of the aquifer must be balanced by a change in storage in, of water in the aquifer. So uh, input to the aquifer occurs as recharge. Recharge is derived from precipitation falling on a land surface and infiltrating to the water table. Uh, it can also occur uh, from streams. Streams can be a source of groundwater. Output to uh, aquifers uh, includes uh, Q out, which is uh, flow from the aquifer to springs or streams or wetlands or oases. Um, groundwater is a source of much surface water. Uh, output also occurs to evapotranspiration, which is the extraction of groundwater by trees and, and other vegetation. Uh, and the output, uh, the other output that we're concerned about is the amount of groundwater that is pumped by humans. Okay, and again, inputs minus outputs must be balanced by a change in, in storage. And so this is just looking at that same water budget equation. And what I want to point out is anytime we increase our groundwater pumpage, it must be balanced by either uh, a, a, a decrease in storage within the aquifer. Uh, and storage, the way that we calculate storage within an aquifer, um, it's uh, change in storage is, is equal to the coefficient that we call a storage coefficient times the change in groundwater level over time. So that is why groundwater levels are really important for sustainable management. We need the groundwater levels in order to calculate the amount of water that is stored in an aquifer and how that amount is changing over time. So um, increase in pumpage must be balanced by a change in storage or an increase in recharge or a decrease in the amount of water that's being discharged to wetlands, oasis, uh, streams, and, and other surface um, uh, water. Uh, in addition, there could be a decrease in the amount of evapotranspiration. So uh, change in aquifer storage. If water le groundwater levels are rising, that, that means our storage is increasing. If, uh, on the other hand, uh, groundwater levels are decreasing, that indicates that there is a uh, decrease in water storage. And I've got a couple of ex examples here. Um, I, I don't have the time scale on, on this plot, but you can see that um, what we get are annual rises and falls in water levels accompanied by a long-term trend of, of increasing water levels. And those annual trends are, are common in uh, uh, many wells. Okay, um, declining groundwater levels can also have uh, effects in addition to aquifer depletion. Before we get to the point where the, the aquifer is being depleted, if we are lowering our water levels, that means that we need to increase the power to, uh, to our pumps to pump that water out, okay? So it increases our expenses. In the worst case, you know, you may need to replace your pump or you may need to, uh, to deepen your well, both of which can be expensive options. Another factor to consider is that as groundwater levels decline, there is often a um, uh, 
uh, deterioration in the quality of the groundwater that's being produced. Uh, and I show this with these two slides. Uh, Long-term uh, decline in groundwater levels is accompanied by a rise in electrical conductivity or, or salinity. And again, this is, this is a fairly common uh, phenomenon. So just to uh, reiterate the benefits of groundwater level monitoring, the information is fundamental to sustainable management. We need the information to determine changes in groundwater storage. Uh, we can also use uh, groundwater levels to help identify effects of climate change and land use change, which can have a, a big effect on our aquifers. Um, groundwater levels can also be used to evaluate connections uh, between groundwater and uh, surface water. And if we get to the point where we can use uh, simulation models for uh, modeling groundwater flow, the uh, groundwater levels are uh, very important for calibrating those models. So. What are sustainable practices that we can use with solar systems to help ensure um, uh, long-term uh, stability of the groundwater system? There's practices that we can use uh, before well installation, uh, after well installation, and, and during operation. Uh, before well inst installation, we want to assess water needs, and, and Jeff you know, highlighted that. You know, how many people, you know, if it's for domestic purposes, how many people will be served and, and what what is the water need per person? If um, if if the water is to be used for irrigation, uh, how much land is to be irrigated and, and what is the water requirements there? Okay, we also need to assess as best as we can the groundwater resources uh, before we uh, design our system. And um, it's best to consult literature and local water users and experts. You know, uh, if people are uh, in nearby locations are already uh, tapping groundwater, consult with them. Find out what you can about you know the depth, the productivity, the water quality of uh, of their their aquifer. Okay, uh, it's also possible that uh, a, a detailed hydrogeological assessment um, could be done. And for many studies, uh, we know that this is not an affordable option. But in some complex geologic settings, it can uh, be well worth the investment of, of doing the hydrogeologic assessment. And, and here, uh, the, the photo is just showing some surface geophysics that are being done as part of a water uh, mission effort to, uh, to try and locate productive zones uh, where uh, it would be good to, to install a well. Um, sustainable practices after well installation. Uh, Jeff mentioned aquifer testing. We can do single well pump tests, which are, are most common. Um, I think Jeff referred to them as yield tests. I sometimes call them specific capacity tests. Uh, but these wells, th these tests will provide information on uh, how much water the, the well can produce. And, and you need that information to properly size your, your pump. Uh, if you have uh, the uh, multiple wells. If you have observation observation wells, you can also conduct a multiple well pump tests, and those tests can provide very useful information on on aquifer properties. Sustainable practices during well operation: again, uh, monitored pumping rate and groundwater level. These solar systems are all equipped equipped with you know, electronic devices to, uh, to help control um, the system, make sure it operates properly. And those systems can also be used for long-term monitoring of pumping rate and groundwater levels. Um, 
Solar powered systems are equipped with a number of pressure and flow sensors. And these are integral components of the system and, and help it operate. Uh, these sensors can also be used to record groundwater levels and pumping rates. Uh, and again, we need that information uh, for, for long-term sustainable management. And I just want to point out that uh, the water level sensors that are installed in uh, the well, uh, usually a, a above the, the pump, the water level sensors are in, in there um, one one reason is to protect the pump because you want to have an automatic cutoff uh, if the water level uh, declines to the point uh, uh, where the the pump is is located. Because if the water level gets too low, then you can burn out your pump, and, and we don't want to do that. But those same water level sensors can be used again, for long-term monitoring of groundwater levels. And here's an example of some groundwater levels that uh, were recorded uh, by a system in Kenya. And this is one of water mission systems. The, um, and, and it's just for uh, about a nine month period. And it, the, period is not really long enough to identify any trends, but uh, just to show you what, what can be done, the, the top chart shows uh, water levels in, in meters below land surface, and the, the bottom level shows the, uh, the pumping rate. Okay, uh, additional sustainable practices during well operation. We really want to avoid uncontrolled pumping. Um, that can lead to uh, huge problems. For example, in, uh, in India, some sections of India, the, the government subsidizes irrigation by providing free electricity to, to irrigators. Well, um, the uh, irrigators uh, have taken full advantage of that and uh, really overpumped their aquifers and there are there are severe aquifer depletion uh, problems there and and they're no longer going to be able to uh, uh, pump the water that they have been pumping and uh, their agricultural production is uh, unfortunately going to uh, decline significantly so what can we do to avoid uncontrolled pumping um, many countries and localities have regulations to help uh, govern groundwater use. Even if there are not regulations, um, many times local users will come together and form um, cooperatives where they agree to jointly manage and control their, their groundwater pumping. Uh, pay for use programs are gaining uh, widespread use where you, you uh, the users need to uh, pay for the water that they, that they extract. And uh, there's also uh, room for improved water efficiency, uh, particularly in terms of irrigation. Drip irrigation is, is uh, very uh, water uh, efficient. And we can also uh, limit the amount of time that solar panels are used for pumping and divert the uh, electricity for other uses at times. Uh, one more sustainable practice uh, is to identify recharge areas. And again, recharge is uh, the water that replenishes our aquifer. Uh, if we can locate the areas where recharge occurs, this, this is, can be beneficial for a couple of reasons. Number one, we may be able to use techniques to enhance uh, the recharge rate. These, this is called management aquifer recharge. The other important reason is, reason is that recharge areas uh, are also areas where aquifers are susceptible to contamination. So we should do uh, whatever we need to do to protect these areas uh, from contamination and then 
um, protect our groundwater resources at the same time. So uh, in summary, uh, solar-powered groundwater systems uh, are improving the quality of life for millions of people worldwide. The, uh, these are uh, very, very beneficial. Uh, at the same time, we need to keep in mind sustainable groundwater management in order to ensure long-term uh, availability of, um, of water supply. Groundwater level and pumping rate monitoring is required for sustainable management. Solar-powered groundwater systems allow for remote and affordable long-term data collection. And I strongly encourage any organizations that are um, installing or supporting these systems to consider the little extra cost that is involved in, in collection, collecting this data. Um, uh, long term, the benefits will, will pay off significantly. And um, it, we'd like to uh, see the development of a database for these groundwater levels and pumping rates. This would uh, facilitate sustainable management uh, practices for groundwater regionally and worldwide. And we're, we're exploring um, ways to do this and funding mechanisms to support this right now. So uh, with that, uh, I thank you and look forward to hearing any questions uh, after Alberto's presentation. Thank you, Rick, for giving us such an amazing presentation. So now I also switch back to my screen first. Perfect. So now moving forward with the webinar, let's have another poll. So I'm going to now display one question on your screen. So the question must be popping up on your screen and please use the question and tell us if you have ever so if you have already installed or are planning to install solar pumping systems and um, as the answers are pouring in, so I'm going to leave it for another, let's say, five, ten seconds. And I'll leave it for another five more seconds as I can see our audience are replying. And now I'll close the poll um, to display the results. So we have a lot of our audience who have already installed the solar water pumping system. So, um, and 25% uh, who have not. So I hope the content so far has been in, um, useful for, for all of you. So now going back to our presentation. I would like to now proceed with our last presenter for today, Alberto Elari from IOMUN Migration. Alberto is a wash and energy manager and has over 15 years of experience in the relief sector. And today, Alberto is going to talk about what are the different economic considerations one should keep in mind when they are looking into solarization of existing water schemes. So Alberto, I'm going to quickly put up your presentation and we can then begin with the presentation. Um, so please begin with your presentation. Yes, um, hello, Ranisa, do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ranisa. Um, good morning, um, good afternoon, or even good evening to, to all of you. In this presentation, I I want to introduce the kind of economic analysis that we have been doing for some time when looking at uh, solar pumping. And also I'd like to share some of the findings when comparing solar to other pumping technology, especially um, diesel generators. So next slide. Just click, click again, Ranisa. Oh, uh, you. Yeah, sorry, there was some animation there. That... Okay, so <clears throat> in many cases, um, as, as you know, 
um, at the time of choosing our pumping technology um, for our water schemes, um, issues like local or climatological factors um, might limit the kind of pumping equipment that, that can be used. But where equivalent performance alternative exists, um, their evaluations will include a number of factors, social, environmental, policy related and others, and also, of course, economic aspects. And we all know that economic considerations are important when comparing equivalent pumping options. And this is not to say that the least cost solution might be the final choice um, always, since other factors might be taken into account. But a cost comparison among different options is is necessary step um, before making a technology choice. And we have been doing solar versus diesel economic comparisons in several countries for, for some years already. Um, and the main questions that we wanted to answer with this kind of economic analysis were, is it the solar option always uh, more expensive than the than the diesel one? How quickly will an extra cost could be compensated by the savings produced? And how much cost will be reduced over time if we choose one option over the other one? Next slide. <clears throat> Okay, we believe that these are our questions that we need to, to respond in. They need to be responded before starting um, any work on the ground. Uh, this in, in order to know how worthy adopting solar or other technologies could be from the financial point of view. But also to be able to, to go back to, to our beneficiaries, to the people we are trying to support or we are working with, to our managers, to our donors, and explain why a particular pumping technology is or not worthy, as well as in case of, of limited budgets, for example, to prioritize those water schemes that um, might produce higher savings more quickly. How we established this comparison was by looking at all present and future for every feasible pumping technology that could meet the required water demand at each of the water points that we analyze. And then after doing that, we look at payback periods, we look at total cost savings, um, and we try to get some conclusions from that. The other thing, um, next slide. Um, the other thing that we did when we established this economic comparison was to to consider the changing um, uh, the changing value of money over time. Yeah? Everyone knows that um, what you could do in your country with 100 US dollars 10 years ago is is not the same as what you can do today or in 10 years time uh, with the same amount with the same 100 US dollars. And because of this, um, when calculating cost over time to buy and run water pumping schemes, uh, we could not add up straight away costs because those cost value are different. And so if we if we do that, we will be getting a wrong picture. So what we did is uh, to convert all the cost, present and future, to money value in the same point in time. We converted all these costs to actually present time. And then when all those costs were converted to the same point in time, we could add them up and see and compare the different options having a, a realistic picture. So in, in um, life cycle cost analysis, for the example of, of the generator in the bottom right part of, of the slide, um, we will convert the 2000 US dollars of year one and the 3000 uh, dollars of year two in today's money value and only then <clears throat> add them to the 10,000 capital cost to have a clear and realistic picture of the total cost. So, um, next slide. Okay, um, I cannot go uh, now in, in the detail on, on how to perform this kind of, of uh, analysis, but if you want to go in the detail of the methodology, I'm offering there different um, tools and resources that, that we develop, that they are freely online. There are a couple of tools.
tools with some videos on how to use them and then a step-by-step -step work example as well in in the book that you can find in that link um, next slide so in summary um, for every of the 165 water schemes that we analyze in 55 different uh, camps and, and villages in eight different countries. Uh, we first made the technical design of feasible pumping technologies. Then we got the prices of the components. We got the present worth of all the future costs for each power source and then perform the life cycle cost analysis in order to see the financial uh, implication of, of these choices. Next slide. So when we did uh, this uh, and plot the cumulative cost um, over time of equivalent pumping system, we almost always found a graph like, like the one you see in your screens. This is a life cycle cost study of a water point in Uganda where uh, we had two options to meet the water demand. One was uh, to power the, the water pump with a, diesel, uh, with a diesel generator, which is the blue line. And the other one was to power that same pump with an standalone solar system, which is the orange one. And as you can see, um, the capital cost of solar is almost uh, three times that of the generator. Uh, the capital cost of solar is about 20, almost $22,000. The capital cost of the generator system is $8,450. So if you only look at this, if you will only look at the capital cost, um, you will always make the generator choice, yeah, from the financial point of view at least. Um, however, um, we can see that uh, looking at the graph, only after 1.5 years for this particular system, the cost saved mainly because um, the solar option doesn't require to pay for diesel uh, every day, uh, compensate that extra capital cost. And from that point in time onwards, we will be saving money if uh, if solar was chosen, yeah. So um, you can see also in the horizontal axis that uh, that's the the time of our design study, which is uh, we we choose for all our studies the longest lifespan of any component of the pumping systems considered. And when when we are considering solar pumping, uh, is the solar panels the one that have the longest lifespan? Nowadays, solar panels can warranty for 25 years if of good quality. And this is a way to factor in the full value of all the components. Now, you might think, oh, well, you know, I, I really don't care much what happened in 25 years' time. But once, once you do the, this kind of analysis, uh, what you can do is to go, to go back in time and you know look back and see what happened for the first year or the first three years or the first five years or whatever period of time you might be interested in for for your project this particular study was made in in 2016 for for a scheme in a local community in west nile in, in uganda um, we shared this with the ngo in charge they decided to solarize by the end of 2017 uh, they already compensated the, the extra cost. By today, um, we estimate that with the money saved, they could pay for another similar uh, solar system uh, somewhere else. So solarizing is not always about having or asking for more money, but about using uh, the money we have in a different way. Uh, next slide. So these are average of, of uh, almost all the studies that we did for those countries. Um, remember that this give an overall idea. You should not apply these numbers to your water point if you are working in, in any of these countries because uh, the studies are dependent of, on the size of the system, the hours of pumping per day and so on. And, and therefore, you know, these studies need to be done scheme by scheme, but the tables give a good overall idea. And as you see, uh, while the cost for solarizing water points are, are normally higher as, as opposed to diesel-based solutions, uh, 
we can we could establish that adoption of solar energy systems uh, most of the time translate to higher uh, savings uh, with time. We also found that for the great majority of cases analyzed, uh, break-even points were between zero to four years, and total cost savings between 40 to 90 uh, percent. In countries with uh, very cheap diesel, like, like Nigeria or Iraq, uh, it takes, of course, longer time to break even. Uh, but in most of all other schemes analyzed, break even periods were short enough to become interesting even for um, humanitarian donors with narrow funding windows. And this is, in fact, what's, what is increasingly happening. This is, this is what we have seen in the last years. Humanitarian donors that were not that interested in the long, interested in the, in the long term, but that are, are coming to, to become more interested and pay more attention in this kind of systems because of these reduced uh, break-even points. Also, um, solar standalone systems have normally shorter break-even periods as opposed to hybrid. And larger systems like hybrid system with high power pumps have uh, longer break-even points, but yield larger net savings over time. Uh, the more pumping hours of generator, the more net savings incur if replaced by solar. So any system out there that relies on high fuel consumption is, is a case for a study to be replaced with solar. Um, and also, Solar typically is, is a strong case from the financial point of view when working in long-term contexts like uh, refugee camps or protracted crises, recurrent crises, or with host communities. Next slide. Okay, the, the failing cost of solar panels, as you can see in the graph on, on the right, uh, which is one of the largest expenditure in many solar pumping systems, are pushing um, this kind of analysis uh, of economic analysis to the point where solar pumping start to, um, you know, be close, uh, start to approach to be competitive as a replacement of of hand pumps. And in that line, um, some countries like uh, Mozambique or Uganda or or Tanzania are already promoting um, policies in that sense, the replacement of hand pumps by, by equivalent solar systems. Um, as predictions are that while pumps or inverters or other components of, of the pumping system might not necessarily get cheaper, but solar panels prices uh, will keep decreasing over the next years. Uh, one of the things that we believe is that as time passes by, this economic analysis might turn more and more positive in favor of um, adoption of solar pumping solutions. And I wanted to finish my, my presentation uh, with this slide for, for Uganda. This is a country that uh, we visited uh, three times in the past, especially the West Nile region, uh, where we ran this kind of analysis for 25 uh, water schemes. I'm showing some of them in the upper part of the slide. Um, and um, with this, we, at that time, thank you, Ranisa. Um, at that time, uh, we wanted to, to lobby for a wider solarization in both the refugee settlements in that area and the local communities in, in West Nile. Um, we know that over the last two or three years, was actors uh, working there led to the solarization of 170 water schemes in that area. And extrapolating our analysis of 25 systems to this 170, we estimated that the solarization campaign uh, will lead to a cost saving over time um, when compared with equivalent diesel systems of um, a little bit over 23 million US dollars or over uh, 8 million US dollars during the five years of operation. With a short break even average of um, of 1.1 uh, years. And these are very impressive numbers um, for, for a WAS operation. Yeah? Uh, if you go to other places like Northeastern Nigeria or Northern Kenya and others, um, you, you will find similar trends. So a last slide on, on takeaway points. Um, some kind of 
life cycle cost analysis is, is a good step uh, before making technology choice as a decision making uh, for for worst teams and also useful if if you need or you want to lobby your managers or government officials in the area where you're working or your donors or or also to have a clear view on how to prioritize investment in your water projects um, humanitarian donors are also uh, increasingly interested in solar water pumping, despite their often narrow funding windows, and life cycle cost analysis um, and, and comparison between different pumping systems are helpful to support the case uh, for solar if you work with that kind of donors. Even more, uh, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance um, in USAID, uh, formerly OFDA, has made now a requirement uh, to include this kind of analysis in proposals if you are asking for funds for, for solar pumping. Yeah? Um, another point that I, I want you to take uh, with, with you, uh, I would like you to, to take after this presentation is, you know, when we go to the field and we engage with country teams from different organizations, we heard many times, yeah, we like this idea, but but we don't have money. Yeah. And what we like to say many times is that solarization is not always about having more money, as I said before, but it's about using that money differently. Uh, and um, we believe that this kind of economic analysis are useful to, to prove that. And finally, um, we have seen a growing adoption of, of solar, especially in, in off-grid and weak grid areas, uh, supported by an increasing financial positive analysis. Um, average break-even points of zero to four. Zero meaning in some sometimes for some small systems, capital costs are already cheaper than an equivalent diesel system. A total save, saving uh, cost over the life cycle of the uh, the lifetime of the equipment, 40 to 90 percent of cost reduction, um, and with time playing in our favor. Yeah. So remember. Uh, very likely, if we if we do this analysis in two, three, four years' time, it, they might get even more positive than now, in a good number of, of contexts. This is not to say that you have to wait for prices to go lower. is is already a good idea from the financial point of view um, to go solar in a good number of of countries and contexts. And that's all. Um, maybe just to to remember in case in case you don't know that we are mandated to support was organizations in in their solar pumping journey uh, and we will be around till the end of this year at least in December 2021 so um, I'm could you pass the next slide Ranisa so I was saying uh, we are mandated to support was organizations will be around for another year uh, and I'm providing there a technical headline either through our web page or writing to that email if you need any support, if you need any access to design software, if you need a second opinion on your design or on anything related to uh, solar pumping, just drop us an email and, and we will do our best to, to support you. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, over to you, Ranisa. Thank you so much, Alberto. I'll just switch, quickly switch back to uh, my screen. Sorry. So here we are. And first of all, thank you to all our presenters. I think we covered a lot of depth in all three presentations, and that is also shown by the number of questions that I've been getting. So without further ado, I would like to quickly switch on to question and answer round. And here, maybe Alberto, I can start with you. So we, in your presentation, we talked about LCCA, uh, levelized cost calculation for comparing generators, hybrid and solar systems. But how can you use it to calculate potential user fee, which are mostly in real time? So is there any kind of um, assumptions that you could uh, share about? Um, to, to capture the, the cost of water from the users. The potential user fee Is to that cover, uh, yes, to potential user fee that will yeah. be used to cover the system cost in the present time. Mm -hmm. 
yes, you can you can include in the same way. If you go, for example, to the to the tools that I was uh, I was showing a link to, um, or, or you see the video on how to use these tools, we can we could easily add a column and and factor in what the people is is paying, or better, what what is the, the difference on what they are paying with one system and what what they are paying with another. And, and and factoring that in the economic analysis we haven't done it um mm -hmm. we know that the people that were paying when there was a, a generator are paying less uh with with solar so water gets cheaper for the users um but uh we we didn't factor in this this cost in, in our analysis but it could be easily done um in 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 the tool in the same way that we factor in the the cost of the components yeah thank you alberto and the tools that alberto and other our presenters mentioned we are going to make all the links available to you on the documentation page and you get an email to, after this webinar and with the link to um, where you can download all of these tools so and if you have any questions like alberto mentioned you can always go back to him and email him so maybe moving forward, um, to, that's, this is a question addressed to both Rick and Jeff. You both talked about uh, uh, like establishing a monitoring groundwater level, but especially when we are talking about humanitarian context where the previous information is not available about the groundwater and so mostly anecdotal, how do you go about it? Maybe um, Rick, you want to go first, then Jeff? Um. Yeah, that's a difficult question, um, you know, especially when there is an, an urgent need to um, uh, provide groundwater. And if you don't have any information, um, uh, it, it's a difficult position. Um, again, I would try to, you know, talk to any local users local experts and, and and get their their recommendations you know there are uh, you know uh, maps such as the one I showed of Africa you know that showed groundwater availability but that is a, at a scale that really is not of too much use uh, when it comes to a, an individual site um, and uh, and I don't, I don't know jeff jeff what are your thoughts yeah but my initial thought was uh, was what you said uh, a lot of times this is where uh, getting into the community having uh, conversations with the the local users uh, can start to to give you a picture uh, even if you don't have that uh, information in a, in a documented uh, study uh, if you can start to talk with them about their existing water system to say, you know, what, how has it been functioning? You know, has it been reliable? What, what flow rates have you seen from it? You know, is that consistent throughout uh, the year? Is there certain seasons where that changes? Uh, a, a lot of those questions, again, this, this may not be um, a, uh, you know, kind of a stamped off from a from a technical yeah. person uh, type of a study, but there's still you can start to gather some information mm -hmm. to at least build the picture by doing that. The other thing that I would add to that uh, is well, uh, similarly, is if you can say, well, okay, maybe we don't have that information about this particular uh, source, this particular borehole, uh, but if there's others in the area, and so we've done this with boreholes, uh, especially where you know, if we're interested in in a certain region. Uh, even if they're, if we don't have the the exact information about that area, if we can go to maybe a borehole in a in a in a joining uh, region or let's say the next community over uh, that we um, have reason to believe is is from the same um, aquifer or same uh, source, uh, you can start to you know then check the picture that you're getting of you know okay if if, if one community is saying we're getting this amount of production on kind of a consistent basis. Does the community next to them say the same thing when you feel like there's a good chance that they're on the same aquifer? So, again, this is that, that's that's not quite a replacement for having um, an, an official uh, study 
uh, done of the yield or the drawdown, um, all those things uh, of that uh, source, but it, it still can start to give you some of that information to build that picture. Thank you so much. Um, Alberto, would you like to add something to that from your also own uh, ground level experience? Uh, no, I think I think Rick and Jeff uh, really um, address all well the questions. I, I I don't have any anything else to add there. Thank you. Um, then the next question is for Rick, and the question is: Sometimes after geological surveys, the wells they start to dry, and it's not because of the aquifer, but rather because of weather changes, um, because of climate change. Uh, what could be done to address such issues? Well, um, so there, there's there's you know several reasons why a uh, a well you know either you know it stops producing at their desired rate or you know you see a reduction in, in how much it can produce um, and you know. One of the reasons I mentioned is if your groundwater levels are decreasing. Um, but you can also have um, problems with clogging of, of the screen in the well. Um, so um, it, it's really hard to make generalizations. You, you, uh, you could do some aquifer testing uh, if. Um, you know, well, number one, if you can monitor the groundwater levels over time, uh, you know that will that will provide a, a lot of information. And um, you know, if they are declining, then you know it can be a problem with the well, uh, but it could be that the aquifer is just not able to produce um, water at the desired rate, and, and that has to do with the amount of water in the aquifer and and the properties, you know how how, how water can be uh, uh, transmitted through the aquifer, and so you know you, you may be stuck with with an option of you know installing multiple wells. It could be that you know uh, the wells are just not going to produce one well is not going to produce enough water, so you may need to uh, install additional wells in order to get up to um, to your desired production rate but again it, it's it's difficult to make generalizations it's because mm -hmm. e each system is different and and you'd, you'd probably need to you know consult with a professional thank you so much and um, then moving forward to jeff the question is about you showed us an example from puerto rico and the question is how did you make the solar water systems that you showed um, hurricane resistant? Or what were the oh, second hurricane. changes for that? Hmm, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, hurricane resistant. Yeah, under, understood. Because yes, there's a there has been a push. Um, th this uh, has been very common in the in the Caribbean, um, however, coastal regions. Uh, of other areas as well, coastal regions of Africa, uh, coastal regions even uh, uh, within the Pacific is true too. Uh, the the idea of being hurricane resistant is the fact that um, it, it, the the thing that needs to be so there's two parts to this. Uh, that's what I'm hesitating on. Uh, the the one is that you're replacing your dependence upon a, a solar grid or a generator. Uh, with solar and so the reason that that would be important you know as soon as the sun comes back up let's say after a hurricane or, or something you potentially have that power source that's uh, replenished immediately there isn't uh you know the the wiring from the grid that needs to be uh reconstructed there isn't a fuel uh supply that needs to be um Reestablished to to get the power source back on. However, I'm I'm assuming that part of this question is saying, well, we need to also make sure that that the solar panels the next day after let's say a, a hurricane, uh, they're able to function uh, appropriately. And that's a great question. There is um, there is great um, great manufacturers of of racking systems. So when I when I talked about actually some of the security measures. 
uh, to uh, around constructing solar arrays that would be uh, to detract from uh, theft and vandalism. I, mm -hmm. I, I did not mention, but there is also the fact that then in a lot of these, uh, especially coastal regions, the Caribbean and others, uh, that there are systems of mounting uh, solar arrays or solar panels themselves to protect them from damage from high winds uh, to where they you know maybe blown off the, the racking or damaged in some other way and so there is a lot of good information out there again from manufacturers that are putting together uh, design protocol and racking systems to ensure that even in the, the aftermath of a hurricane, uh, there's minimal damage to your array so that again, the, when the storm passes, the sun comes back up, you, your system can come back uh, online quickly. And so that's what I would recommend to do if, if that's the concern to make it resilient. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, again, some funding that's coming from uh, UN agencies or others is saying that's why they have comfortability of saying this is a resiliency a measure to put in uh, solar in these areas that uh, experience uh, hurricanes or other uh, natural disasters that can threaten the, the power supply. Well, um, Ranisa. So yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, I'll no, I, I would like to add something to, to Jeff, uh, to Jeff answer, mm -hmm. because we were running a, an online event, an, an online training for the Pacific nation of Vanuatu earlier this week, and this question uh, came. Mm -hmm. And what what they are doing there is is you know there is a moment uh, when the hurri the hurricane is if it is if it is too strong it's not a problem of having the solar panels being blown away is is a problem that things that are blown away will damage the panels for them for example branches of trees coconuts all kind of things that that are taken by the hurricane and then is master panel so they they develop some guidelines on that that, that i could share of, if, of interest but basically what they are doing there is if the hurricane is of category four or higher they just dismantle the panels they dismantle the panels they put them in a safe location when the hurricane has passed they put them back and then start pumping yeah that's that's all Thank you so much, Alberto and Jeff. And yes, we will link those materials that Alberto just talked about so that you can read about them later on in the documentation. And also a quick note that uh, if there are more questions about security with, with relation to theft, we also have covered it in our first webinar. So I encourage you to also go and listen to that one. And then moving forward, I have one question for you, Alberto. So uh, the question is, how best can we deliver energy and water together to provide end user benefits? Um, this is more like looking for common financing or decentralized models. Energy and water. Uh, I, I'm not sure if the question is how it's like providing also energy, but apart from providing water. So energy um, and water, so water pumping and energy for lighting and homes together, yeah. new way to design. Yeah, well, we we get this kind of 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 questions sometimes. Um, like, can we, you know, can we branch the solar pumping uh, to to other appliances and to, you know to provide energy in our community or to power something else than a water pump? And um, what we realize is that um, you can you can do two things. You can either use the the solar array for pumping for yeah. other uses. So you you will switch off your pump and then use those panels to power something else. Um, we have some examples in India where um, they they use the panels to produce electricity. So this is grid connected. They sell electricity mm -hmm. and this is a revenue for the community. So say I pump four hours a day and then I, I branch it to the grid four hours a day. Yeah. So this kind of separate thing is possible if you can get all the water you need in a few hours of, of pumping and then use that for another thing. What we don't think is, is a good idea is to branch a number of things at the same time because what you you will not be able to know how much power is going to the pump and how much power is going maybe to the lighting or to whatever you want to power at the same time. And therefore, it's, 
it's going to be difficult to know how much water you are, you are going to get from there. If you want to do those kind of things, um, because the solar panels are, are so cheap now, what we recommend is just use a separate a separate solar panel or a separate array of panels for uh, you know charging your batteries or your mobile phones or 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 powering another thing separate from your solar water pump in, which you know is designed to provide um, a, a water um, the water quantity that you need yeah I think these are the two the two situations I'm I'm not sure I, yeah okay. Uh, sorry, Alberto, I had to cut in because uh, we are nearing towards the end. Uh, is there anything okay. you'd like to add? Or? No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Well, thank you. Um, then since we are coming towards the end of the webinar, I cannot take any more questions, but uh, just a quick note to the audience. There were so many questions about monitoring batteries. We have talked some of them already in the previous webinar. Do have a look and also stay tuned for the webinar documentation because whatever questions we have not been able to answer right now, we'll answer them in written form and upload them to the documentation page so that you can read it afterwards. And that brings me towards the end of the webinar. A huge thank you to all our panelists for the amazing presentations. I think we all learned a lot today. And for our audience, thank you for staying with us till the end. And here are some of the links to resources that you can read about solar water pumping and there's also the contact information if you'd like to contact Alberto and his team and yes thank you so much and I hope you join us in February for our next webinar and I wish all of you a good day thank you and bye-bye okay thank you thank you Ranisa and Rick and Jeff and Asenad have all a good day goodbye thank you all